Hi, this is Louis Simmons here, and I'm looking for some real lifters. All right? Uh, in the last two years, we set 10 all-time world record squats. Uh, Raw at 120, uh, 132, 635. At 123, 700. Lightest person ever squat, 700. A female squat at 680 and 85 and 148s. Uh, three world record benches, a 910 at 181, a 500 at 123, and a 505 at 132. Uh, 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 and four total world records, all right? I'm looking for somebody that wants to come here and be great like this. I prove this all the time. Now we're probably up to 170, 75 all-time world records. It's easy for me to do this if I've got the, the people to do it with. So anyone's interested, you got to be serious. you got to train in the morning from 114 to super heavy. I don't care. And as uh, long as you can come train in the morning and you want to be, you want to be in this sport and be famous, this is the place to come. Welcome to the West Side Barbell Podcast. Today's podcast is a little different. We're going to hone in on building up your deadlift. Lou, we got a bunch of questions in, and mostly around uh, deadlift accessories. The first one we have is, can you explain the difference of developing, uh, or sorry, the importance of developing the back, the glutes, and hamstrings using deadlift variations such as Romanian deadlifts, etc.? Yes, well, I'm not a fan of Romanian deadlifts, but we do many, many special exercises for the hamstring, glutes, low back, uh, abs, of course, in the traps. And uh, like, for instance, the hamstrings is a great contributor to deadlifting. And so we start out on the inverse. If I brought a person here, I'd start them on the inverse curl, get them where they can work down where they're using the body weight. And then uh, secondly, then I take it to a glute ham bench, work them on there with some weight, and then where they're doing real Russian leg curls. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of reverse hypers. The reverse hypers also build the glutes and the hamstrings. You talk about Romanian deadlift. It was tested in New Orleans years ago with Olympic weightlifters. It, it doubled the production of muscle firing two to one compared to Romanian deadlift in the glute and the hamstring. Low back. Yeah. And I said, it's a glute developer. You know, you need to test the glutes as well. And then, um, but we do a lot of that. One of my top deadlifters, for instance, uh, Chris Spiegel, 915, conventional with a hook grip. Pulled 915 and super heavies. Two of his major exercises was um, standing leg curl and uh, the good morning machine, the back attack. We did tons and tons. Very, very heavy on the back attack and very heavy on the standing leg mm -hmm. curl as well. So uh, it's a lot of hamstring, low back. Uh, good mornings is one of my favorite exercises always. Years ago, before I had all this equipment, I would squat and I would do good mornings. Uh, even back in the 80s when Chuck Bogopol started, uh, after we'd squat, I was still, that was my <coughs> major exercise. I just, I did as many good mornings as I did squats, yeah. every workout. So a lot of those, a lot of abs, a lot of hanging leg raise. Um, you have to break the deadlift down into portions because to get it off the ground, it takes strong abs and knee flexion. Uh, if it gets stuck at the knees, it's normally low back because your hip is far away from the bar as it's ever going to be at that position. And then at the top locking out, if you can't lock out, it's almost always loose. Can't get your hips to move forward. Mm -hmm. It could be a tight psoas, it could be weak hip muscles, it could be weak glutes. So we train all of those. When we break it down, watch a person. I just had a kid come in. Um, uh, you know, he had a uh, five, 530 deadlift, and he, he's already pulled 650 and got 670 turned down with a small hitch. This is 181 under one year by training all special exercises. Mm -hmm. The other kids of 48, he pulled, um, when he came here, he could pull 525, he's already pulled six, and just missed 645 by by a, a little bit, you know. So why? Because he got in a good morning machine. He could even stand straight up in a good morning machine. He had no glutes, no hips, no glutes. Ultra wide sumo deadlift made a huge difference on the hips and the lockout. And uh, also we do a lot of ultra wide, feet out to the plates, straight leg, arch back. It's all hamstring and lower back, and it builds up the hips when you lock them out. It's a tough exercise, but as you get used to it, your deadlift will fly. Everyone's always done straight leg deadlifts in close stance, but try them ultra wide sumo, and you'll see it really works. A lot of sumo deadlifters anymore, so probably more sumo than conventional. Yeah. Can you go over the uh, what you've learned with each generation of lifter on the deadlift? Because when I came here, 900 was the overarching goal and then once you hit 900 that was the baseline for these guys coming up 
But from when you started, just say in um, in your basement all the way up, what did you learn each way to get to where you're at now? More training. More reverse. I tell people, you know, there's a difference between working out and training. Uh, when you guys will work out and they stop, I tell people when you when you when you do your sets and you're dead, do two more sets. Do two more sets. Hit those muscles like a bodybuilder does. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working for hypertrophy. We're working for strength. Uh, they do a couple extra sets always, and you got to come back and, and repeat it. Now, uh, weightlifters normally would never come back and do the same exercise, but a lot of times we do. I used to go back and do uh, you know heavy. I lived on reverse hypers, heavy glued hams, and and a lot of abs and pull sleds. But I'd come back at night and I'd, I'd repeat my reverse hyper workout 480 for four sets of 10 at a minimum. <laughs> and Chuck Vogelpool did the very same thing. We actually used the very same weight. And uh, so just we just hammer it, hammer and hammer it. And that's how you get strong. It's, it's accumulation of training. I, I realized years ago uh, that uh, I started as National Record for 1971 in squat. And I, there's no gear, IPF, you yeah. know, you had to train deep. And I went to three meets. I, I did not break my boss squat record for a year and a half, but I broke my squat record in three meets. And looking back, I said, how did I do that? Accumulation of training. Just keep beating it, beating the horse until it, it woke up. And it's, you were very um, analytical of where you put that effort, correct? Right. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Always hit by lower back, hamstrings, and glutes. The, the key here, though, why my, my deadlift went from 525 to 670. In that year and a half, in the 181s, two hour weigh in, no gear. Yeah. No, nothing. No power belts. There was no power belts. It's 1970, from 71 to 73. When did you realize uh, the importance of your stomach deadlifting? It seems to get overlooked a whole lot. Well, I realized right away because, you know, what's the first thing you do when you pick a weight up? You take a breath of mm -hmm. air in your belly. At least you should. The more air you have in your stomach, abdominal, the greater abdominal pressure, the least spinal cord pressure. So it's very important to have a strong stomach and be able to learn how to pack it. We would call pack if you watch Vogel pull on some tapes, make yeah. your meat. It would go, <laughs> just blow up my belly up like a ball. Mm -hmm. Then I lift the weight off the ground. And Chuck did the same thing. Chuck was wide, I stuck out. Gotcha. Um, what are some of the things that you notice? Because a lot of people from different sports come in here when they pull a deadlift. What's the most common weakness? Uh, one, they train way too slow. Uh, they train mostly, for the most part, too heavy deadlifts. They don't use any speed work. Uh, we train our deadlifts. I'll get into this later, but uh, at 80 and the next week, 85 and 90 percent for 25 lifts, five sets of five. We do them on boxes. Now, if you pull a 600 deadlift, but you pull uh, 500 on a box, you take 80 percent off 500 if you're on the box. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a rack pull and you pull 700. Then you take 80% of 780, the next week 85, 9. And you just rotate them all the time. Yeah. Uh, pay attention to what you're doing. It, it does take some math math skills to be able to do this because it's very important to keep the percents right. Why? So the velocity is correct. You now, the RPMs in the car. If you undershift the car, it doesn't have a horse. You, over, you overwind it, and also the horse is going down. So you want to shift it to shift points. Yeah. Same thing for us 80, 85, 90. It's 5% uh, over what Olympic lifters do, but Olympic weightlifters are in a speed strength sport, and we're in a strength speed sport. Uh, weightlifters have to be strong in fast motions. We don't. We have to be strong in slow motions, in slow velocity. Yeah. There's no time limit to what we do, and we only have one pull. We don't have two. Uh, would you rate the deadlift as one of the most important exercises for every athlete to do? I think the deadlift's the king of all of them. Yeah, because you have to have strong hands. Uh, I mean, like, you know, if I rate my gym over the years, who's the strongest guy, I would take the biggest deadlift right down to the bottom. Not because of, you know, because you got bench shirts, you got squat suits and all this. So the deadlift, no matter what you do, is pretty much, you know, deadlift's a deadlift. You, yeah. It takes strong people. But, you know, so. Um, when did you, I, I know you think you've got notes on this, but how you set up a, building up your deadlift. When did you bring in speed work into that? Actually, speed work, I never did speed work until 1982. Uh, I broke my back the second time in 1981, trained with it all year long. And then I said, well, there's got to be a better way. I mean, I couldn't lay down for 17 weeks. This is second. This is a moderate injury compared to the first one. And so I said, there's got to be a better way. And I, I bought mm -hmm. all the books that Bud Connick had. 
And I remember I called him up and he said, well, you know, Lou, these are classroom books. I said, exactly what I want. I got to understand this. I just can't look at pictures like, you know, Playboy magazine. I got to see what's real, the science mm -hmm. behind this. Then I realized he's talking about velocities, intensities, uh, kinetic energy, and all these other things, you know. And I said, damn, I never thought about this. So I started applying it. And then I realized you have to do because because I never heard the word force equals mass times acceleration. Mm -hmm. And to this day, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't believe in the speed work. That's why they don't excel or they, they kill themselves. Too, you know, too many slow lifts and then they get slower. Well, they seem to pick the freaks of nature. Well, if that person can do this, like there's only one Ed Cohen, there's only one Dave Hoff. Right. And if you try to model yourself off them, it's like a... Yeah. Those magazines train like GSP. You're not going to be GSP. GSP is no, GSP. I, you're right, Tom. Everybody wants, they see, well, Eddie did this or, or, or you know, uh, Dave Hoff did this. Well, you're not Dave Hoff. You're not Eddie Cohen. You're not Mike Bridges. It ain't yeah. going to work, bud. You know, you go dream it all you want. It ain't happening. So, yeah, you have to formulate your own program because we're all built somewhat differently. If, Dead, deadlifters are built. Yeah. I mean, to start with, if you lock out on your knees, you've got a good chance of getting a big deadlift. And it takes a lot of strain off the lower back. You know, if your arms are, if you lock out three inches longer, lower than me, me, you're starting three inches higher than I am, and you're locking out three inches lower than I am. Yeah. You know, it's a big advantage. Um, what was the, what was the difference in the training groups when you started bringing in speed work? Did you notice everyone started getting on board and their lifts started going through the roof, or was it a slow transition in? Well, in the beginning, they watched me because they didn't think it would probably work. But then they found out it did because I began to come back after a, severe, a serious back injury. And all my lists just took off. I was very slow. And all of a sudden, I'm blowing up weights like I can't even believe it. Yep. I thought maybe I was lifting out of fear. But what it was, I was actually training myself for speed finally, you know, for acceleration. You must accelerate. Like in a football game, it don't matter how fast the guy is. It matters how fast he is when he hits somebody. So that's the key, you know, that's why, you know, accommodating resistance works as well. Can a low box squat be useful in developing a deadlift? I think it, for me, it was one of my best things. I squatted on a 10-inch box, and it really helped my deadlift because that's the starting position of a deadlift. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was healthy, I would squat all the way down where my butt would almost hit the ground. My arms would be bent, but as I started, my arms were straight before I just pulled the bar, and that's how I did it. If you watch a European weightlifters, a lot of them lift that way, and that's where I got it from. And uh, so it worked for me, but it just builds the hell of your lower back, low, low squats. If you look at these Olympic lifters, I think they get an enormous amount of low back development out of the overhead squats they do mm -hmm. real low. You've wrote a lot about good mornings, and we've touched upon them here. But why are they such a good accessory overall, but especially for the deadlift? Well, because it builds the deadlift and the squat at the same time. And uh, so, you know, I mean, a lot of my workouts were just good morning workouts. A bit higher, when I pulled 670 and I just spent 700 and 181 is too hard weigh-in, um, I did 435 for five bit over good mornings, no bell. So, you know, being skinny, I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, at the time I was five, six and a half, I've shrunk a little bit. And, uh, but my lower back was incredibly strong at that point. World record, Vincent O had a 710. You know, then it, then, Marty Joyce and a few other, Bob McGee come along and it started moving up pretty quick at that point. But at one point I was 40 off. Then I decided to break my back and be on crutches G yeah. just for fun, you know. <laughs> um, I witnessed some... But I like yeah. to say something. Even though I, I was on crutches for 10 months, I came up to reverse hyper exercise, all right? But I came back to make top 10 deadlifts in two more weight classes. I think that's a testament that the good mornings and the reverse, you know, all this, what we do works. And I was top 10 deadlifter at 57 years old in the 220s. Now, not many people, you know, they might put a bench on and do this, but yeah. they don't do it in a deadlift. And I did. Top 10 in deadlift in 1971, top 10 in deadlift in 2004, five, 34 years. So that, that kind of says something. I might have been, not been the greatest, but I kept up with everyone. How did you do it? I did it through millions of good mornings, millions of low back work. You know, you, you have to attack. You know, you fight fire with fire. If you got a back injury, you got to train. So I did. Like I said, lots of good mornings, arch back, bent back, closed stance, wide stance, one foot on a box, all types. Concentric good morning where I crawl underneath and stand up. I always felt that was more like a lift. Uh, I did. I like to bend over like in a squat because you have to lower the bar. So I lower myself in the good morning and come up just like a squat. I, you see, I 
in concentric motion. And uh, but a lot of good mornings and uh, a lot of heavy back raise at 181. I used to use 135. I had no train parts, so I could get on my back. Yeah, I had to get over my oh, on my own back. And I did four, uh, 135 for sets of five and six reps, quite a few of them. And and that was prior to the reverse hyper. When I broke my back and I started doing those somewhere in, in 1974. And uh, I, I, did, I did a lot. I pulled 17 and 98 in 1977 or 8. And with strapping weights on my feet with a belt, I did a 200 for 10 and 200 for 8. My, and that's a lot of weight when you do them strict. Yeah. And I did them strict. I didn't let swing myself under. I got them up, held for a split second, held, held like that. And uh, so my lower back was, I mean, it's crazy strong. I always wondered had I not broke it a couple of times yeah. in front of Ben, but, but that's the way it goes. You know, I can't drive out spilled milk. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all the no, that's stuff. Not, that's how I way. learned. Yeah. How's a guy learn how to fight? Get hit in the face enough, you learn to keep your hands up. Or get out. <laughs> yeah, get out. I never wanted to, I could not get out. I couldn't make myself quit. You know, I'm a mess now, but I mean, I, you know, that's how I make my living. I, you know, it's how we, we do everything. That's how I learned. I know not to do something because I did it. If I tell you don't do that, it don't work. I did it. I know. <laughs> you know. Do you know where the good morning within training originated from? Or was there anyone that was really particular in bringing it mainstream? It's a very old exercise. And what it got a stain by, you know, meeting somebody in the morning, bidding over, say good morning. Yeah. You know, you would, you'd round over and good morning. That's how he got his name. A guy called Bruce Randall um, is 400 pounds, and he, he broke his leg and um, severely couldn't squat anymore. So he started doing good mornings. He did power good mornings, where he would, like, squat down, you know, bent leg. Like, Vince Nell did a lot of bent leg mm -hmm. good mornings. Well, uh, Bruce would do this until – but what he found out was he did, like, 435 good morning, and then he dropped into a full squat. He couldn't believe it. So then he ended up doing, like, 750, and he could squat 750. Now, he could not squat. Until we started doing these good mornings, power good mornings. And then he found out, you know, he'd been as, just drop on down to a power, parallel squat. And then he, he reduced weight in one Mr. Universe. It's quite a story. He'll look it up sometime, Bruce Randall. Yeah. The Bruce Randall stories. But he lived on good mornings. Uh, Bob Peebles lived on good mornings. You know, w w you, you, he had, a, he had a, a yoke. Like we got bars like uh, the Mars bar. You yeah. Know? But he had a yoke. It would, you, you set the bar up on your neck. And then down a couple inches, down a couple inches, down a couple inches, and he used all these positions. So real low, he could use an enormous amount of weight. Real high, of course, as yeah. you go towards your neck, use less weight. Leverage is bad, but he used all these positions with that yoke. I mean, he pulled seven twenty-five in the forties and one eighty. So with the hook. What's the most remarkable good morning you've witnessed? I watched Vlad and Burley Burley. Um, do uh, H65 for a triple, both of them, at two different, you know, not yeah. together, two different times. And uh, Vlad, at the time, went, we here in Columbus, we went to meet, he scored a world record 1250, and he did it to 925 easy. Yeah. Is there always a correlation if you have a high good morning to a solid deadlift? Uh, as long as you're doing a good morning. Stand to the side of people and make sure that the bar is in front of the knees. Uh -huh. Too many people will squat down and the bar does not get in front of the knee, so it's actually, it's kind of a, a quarter squat or a messed up squat of some kind. And if you're- As the guy used to do him on the gym, we, we named it after him, but I won't say who it was. <laughs> um, I don't want to come in after me after all these years. Chuck named him. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. But it wasn't a squat or a good morning. Yeah. It was somewhere in the middle, you know. Um, but but uh, if you go to meets, you don't see so much more of gear. But I used to watch the guys with the most horrendous squat form I have ever seen. But they were big deadlifters. So every damn squat they did was like doing a good morning. You know, they did good mornings and he did squats. Uh, a guy called Spack the Whack. He was, his, his squat was so bad, he would tell the spotters, don't take the weight. Drop down, roll his ass totally up in the air, and good morning, you think back up. He would tell the spotters, don't touch the weight. Because everyone else was thinking it's coming yeah. over his head. That's how I did it. And I remember he pushed me from second place to third in a national championships in, in uh, New Jersey in 1971 by coming out and pulling 650 deadlift to you know, jump ahead of me. You know, in the 181s, so that's a big deadlift, you know, right back then. Does Steve Goggins have similar form? Uh, and his squat he did. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Not that radical, but yeah. Steve squatted backwards how we tell people to squat, you know. 
Absolutely, yeah. 100% back. We stick our butt out, he round over. Yeah. He'll stick it out in the bottom where we, we stick it out in the very beginning. And is that because you just have an ultra strong lower back? Yeah, and uh, I was at the APF, uh, I mean, I was at the WPO at the Arnold Classic, and he was getting uh, worked on by a chiropractor, and he was back here in his shorts, and I've never seen such huge hamstrings in my life. His hamstrings, his freaking leg was like that wide, sitting sideways. Yeah. Unbelievable hamstrings. I mean, I watched him pull 870 with a hook when, uh, I think he weighed 260, and he squatted, the first guy to squat 11, weighing 260. Squat 11 or two. But a lot of first people look back, now they hear these numbers, now they ain't much, but he yeah. guy didn't have his gear. Is that what made Andy Bolton's lift so special? The first guy to get a thousand? A Andy Bolton did a lot of speed work. He yeah. set him every train board in 70, 80 percent, a lot of speed work. That's what he believed in. Mm -hmm. And he was just immensely strong guy. He squatted over 1,200, you know, so. Do you think because of the access to information, that's why there's so, like, the deadlifting is booming right now in terms of numbers going out? I, I think I know why. Isometrics. Uh, people, the key to deadlifting is starting position. And no one gets in the good stuff, especially big people. Their arms are in front of their knees when they start sumo. You got to be able to get your arms inside your legs. The closer you can start your get your pelvic to that bar, the more you're going to limp because it's almost like in a stand up position. How do you do that? I like the Russians. Uh, remember, that's why we do chair deadlifts. Mm -hmm. Was that Bel Belkin? Is that his name on 242 for Russia? Pulls like 870. I watched the guy. And I watched, and whoever had it had because I don't have yeah. fancy stuff. But I, I, they showed it to me on their phone. I go, man, this guy's got great form. And it slid in better, and he picked the weight up. I go, wait a minute. I got to see this again. He got in there, perfect form. Then he slides even better form and picks the weight up. I go, how in the hell is he doing that? So I said, well, you know, uh, what he's doing is isometric. He's mm -hmm. coming up here and told people. And uh, like at, uh, at Cohen Girl down mm -hmm. in Florida. But I found out, well, if I sit on a box... I have a guy sit on a box, put my hand right here. Now, one side Barbo did this, Culver City years ago. Hand on the sternum, hand on the sacrum, and you start to pull. They push you like this, and they push your pelvic forward and your shoulders backwards. And it builds that um, uh, it's like counter flexibility. Lever, yeah. And that's what they're doing. Try, uh, um, you know, uh, isometric deadlifts in the bottom position just for uh, nothing else but for mobility and flexibility. It'll build the hell out of your start. Once you, you know, sumo, you get the thing started, you're going to, almost always going to make it. Because uh, your hips are always closer to the bar than they are conventional. Getting back to the chair deadlift. I was here when you were, when you were trying to figure out the source, when you figured out you came up with it. But what was the inspiration behind that? Was it that lift or was it getting that, that form? Uh, well, how, how is this guy doing this? How much has that helped athletes here? Um, my buddy, Andre Skiba, told me he took a guy from 567 to what he did with in six months. Enormous. People don't stick with something. Yeah. They just will not stick with it. If you stick with something for a while, you'll, it, you'll get results. Uh, I found out a minimum. I always tell people, give me in three, you talk, you see it. In three weeks, I could change a person. Mm -hmm. Three-week wave on the fourth week, I can change them. And uh, so it doesn't take that long, but you got to do it. And isometric, you do several times a week. Yeah. There's two ways to do it. You can do maximal efforts pulling on a bar, or you can do about 50% for about 20 seconds. Now, Russians did a lot of research on this, and they found out that makes you basically as strong as doing maximal efforts. Mm -hmm. you got to breathe. Yeah. All right? That's why, and I always say, well, why are these rosters? A lot of guys, fighters come, and always grab onto me, and I'm going, to, how could I not move this little bastard? He's 106, <laughs> I can't even move him. Yeah, but he can't lift no weights. Yeah. And it's all the quasi-isometric. Mm -hmm. That's why. I mean, you're just, you know, you're going, I want that. Is this guy made out of iron or what is going on here? When you say they don't stick with it, um, just to clarify to people out there, one, if you're very good at an exercise, you shouldn't be doing this. You should go at what you're doing bad. Right. But what do you consider getting the most out of an exercise? Well, when do you know it's time to move on? Well, you know, we switch exercises all the time. But some things like mobility exercise, you can do several times a week. Yeah. Um, and if you got, like Laura Phelps had impeccable deadlift form. Problem was her deadlift would go nowhere. So I told her you got to put the bar in front of her, make it awkward. And that's what, she jumped about 60 in the deadlift from 5 to 560. And uh, my buddy Gary Sanger the same way. Uh, he was so precise, but if he leaned over an inch, he'd miss. Yeah. So we got, we, we learned to heat. Uh, bent over good morning is very valuable to him. 
And I mean, he was getting number 98 in the world in 1984. And then, like I said, Laura, it took Laura's deadlift up, skyrocketed. Because some people got such good form, they, they're not applying any force to the bar. You know, it's just, it's all just leverage. What I want to say something about good mm -hmm. points, too. Large men, and like, I mean, I was sick. I've always been thick. Even at 81, I was sick. But large, you, I see guys doing singles in the good morning. Only concentric when I do that. Uh, a regular bent over good morning, you need to do reps because large men, well, they don't understand, but leverage is lifted away, not muscular contraction. Your, your belly and you're thick, and that's why you're lifting away. That's why, why is there so many thousand pound squatters? I mean, you can't count them all now, and two 1,000 pound deadlifters. Actually, one official, you know, Andy yeah. Holt was the only one. The other guy did it in a deadlift contest or something. And then Eddie Hall did the same. It was three, right? Eddie Hall, Benedict Magnuson. Well, and but he did it in a deadlift contest. Comes, yeah. You know, he didn't do it in an open contest. Gotcha. Yeah. How important are bands and doing something like strength speed for deadlifting? Very important. You know, a lot of people think, a lot of people misunderstand bands. Oh, you don't need bands. Well, why the hell not? You can stand up with a thousand, you can come out of the bottom of 400. So, you know, you can be a perfect weight in the bottom and a perfect weight at the top. Yeah. It, it, you know, but you, you, if weights is too heavy, bands would be too light in the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. So, you got to use a combination. That's what's called the me combination methods training. And, um, but if you put a ton of band on the bar, let's say it locks out an extra 350 pounds, well, you know it's going to do it. So, you're going to start even faster than normal. It's not just at the top. If you got a half a brain, you're going to start that damn bar fast. I've seen guys go in, can't budge, especially in the, even in the cleans. They come in, they miss, they miss, they miss, they miss. Boom, all of a sudden they're making it. Then they jump and jump and jump and jump. Why? Because their brain accommodates the central nervous system, finally learns what the task is asking to be performed. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they start to um, manhandle these weights. So I, I've seen college colleges test a 100-pound band. You've got to be good. I mean, we use a 700 pound of bands sometimes. Well, I remember when we went through our little experiment of keep adding bands and bands, and we keep adding red and monsters, then uh, went through purples. And if you could handle, if you could recover from it, that was the big thing. Yeah. You the PRs you got never never ended, but it was a recovery. But what was crazy to me after two weeks of just easing off it is that the strength never went anywhere for six months. Mm -hmm. And I think people really underestimate like pulling through and getting through that sticking point with bands because bands don't give you any favors. They're trying to kick your ass every time. Sure. Um, but is it, there a... It's, it's, it's peak contraction throughout the full range of motion. Is that much band tension required for people who are just beginning or do you keep that in the tank until you progress? Um, no matter who you are, I've done this for so long. I started these bands. All right. For speed strength, it's 25 to 33 percent. We found out that we use 25 forever, and it seemed like our lift stalled. I took it up to 33, and 10 world records in the last, the last two years in a squat. Three roll. A 635 raw, 120, 132. All right. So, but we broke 10 all time world records in the last two years. Why? Because I pushed the band tension up. Well, just to accompany that, when you did that, it carried over to all the other athletes. Right. And if you look at the fighters, their punching power and their grappling and their conditioning went through the roof just by that because when they do their uh, dynamic effort work, because you have them, you don't have them for four days, they do uh, bench, squat, and deadlift all in the same row. But it went through the, once after they, about two or three weeks in, you could see. Once they get used to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, see, the weights can move too fast. If they move too fast, you don't produce any force. That's Hill's equation of muscle contraction. You know, it's a force velocity curve. So you have to have the right amount of weight, you know, and the right amount of band for the right amount of velocity. Mm -hmm. I say it's all about velocity training. Why does a diesel got low RPMs, it got all that torque, right? And then a race car is, you know, 8,000 RPM or whatever. Big difference because you're looking for two different sources of power. Where the Depths of deadlifts originate, and why are they uh, so important? Well, people are doing depths of deadlifts. Don Blue, Ricky Crane, all these guys, that's where I got it from. I mean, I just, I would read magazines and, and, and Westside Barbell, Culver City, uh, stand on, I mostly, believe it or not, they used to stand on a, um, a, um, a build-up Coke box. You used to get Coke bottles, 24 bottles in a wooden crate. Yeah. It ain't like today, you know. And so they flip it upside down, they deadlift off. That's where I got it from. Because longer range of motion. 
If you pull longer range of motion, you're going stronger. It'll build the beginning and the end of a lift, depend on where you lie. Yeah. Because you're lifting the weight four inches farther. Would that, would that help someone uh, who has trouble? You see some people who can't budge the weight off the platform. But once it gets going, they're going. It will, providing if people don't understand box, they, they think it's for your back, but it's actually for leg drive. Oh. Now, Jenks came here, mm -hmm. and he had an 840 deadlift for a year, and in 14 weeks training here, he pulled 890 to 242s, and he me. And he, it was four inches conventional to box uh, for three weeks, all right? Then a four-inch box sumo for three weeks, which is right percents. And then it was three weeks on a 10-inch box with a, our five-inch cambered bench press bar where his hands is four inches lower in the ground. Jinx told, I, I always ask, I don't assume anything. I said, Jinx, what worked the best? He said that 10-inch box. It taught, because that way you squat so low, teaches you to engage your legs longer and to keep them in the lift longer. He said that transferred into then his back extension. He felt that was the key to the whole program. And was that just for speed work? Did, did that, that was speed work. work. That's our 25 squats, deads after our 25 benches. Did he use bands or was that just straight weight? or? It could be either. And Whatever your record is, take 80, 85, 90. But bands, no bands, four inch box, sumo compensable, which is going to be different or whatever, you know. And it's in on a 10 inch box. I pulled 570 like that and I pulled 716 off of me. Uh, I, I, I went to me, I broke my back second time. I go to me and I was just stiff. I barely could pull 550. I couldn't even get to the bar. So I went back and said, what's well, the hardest thing I could do? So I come up with that. Me and Gino Cardi. Gino had a 700-pound deadlift. So Adito was real strong on the floor, and I was weak locking out. Yeah. Okay. So we both did it. I ended up going from zero to 570, pulled 716, and, and Gino went from, I don't remember where he started, but he pulled 700 like that, and he went from 700 deadlift to 766. It's a short period of time. It was about six months. So it got me right back up in the top 10, like four and five in the deadlift right off the bat. But it's the most severe. Like I've, I've always said, if you want to master Kung Fu, the training must be severe. If you go in there and just screw around the gym, you're going to get screw around results. Uh, in your brain, do you have a coaching blueprint? Someone comes in and where they stall on the bar, you know, okay, this is where they're weak. This is the accessory work. Yeah. Like, is every inch going up, you know what part of the body part is lagging from that? Like I mentioned before, on the floor, it's almost always knee extension and abs. At the, at the knees, it's low back because your hips is far away from the bar. Yeah. And then lockout is the glutes and hips. Then... And, and, you know, no one mentions the psoas. Not only do you have to have a healthy psoas, it also has to be strengthened through leg mm -hmm. raises and everything. You know, a lot of groin work. People don't think like that, but that's very important in track. Yeah. Uh, as well, you got a lot of injuries in track. I'm writing right now, I just wrote an article about injuries in football. I see you guys pulling hamstrings, they're not even touched. And if you don't, if you have a misalignment of your spine, it's like if you misalign your car, you're going to wear your tires out. Mm -hmm. If you misalign your spine, you're going to have low back tightness, which leads to IT poles and hamstring poles. All right. And, it, and, a lot, and a lot of times it could come from the psoas. Mm -hmm. It'll start to pull, it'll twist your body in a circle. Um, we have another question about going over the benefits of the giant cambered bar and the impact it's had on the posterior chain strength development. The big bar? The big cambered bar. I got that from Bruce Randall. I mentioned him before. Yeah. Uh, Bruce would use a bar like that. It was easy to hold on to. He's a 400-pound guy. Yeah. You know, back then he had 52-inch bars. I lifted on him for years and years and years. Eddie Cohn pulled uh, his 901 deadlift on a 52-inch power bar, not a deadlift bar. I mean, and uh, I watched Mike Bridges pull 771, 81s mm -hmm. on a power bar, not a deadlift bar. That's amazing. I, I would have to add 50 pounds to those type of lifts if he'd had a deadlift bar. Well, is the tensile Maybe strength more. different between the bars? Yeah, no flexion. Yeah. Would you use that as another accessory? So if you wanted to change up your deadlift, you go to a stiffer bar? The rushes did. I had an Ivanko bar, uh, you know, and that bar was so stiff. Most of I ever pulled in the gym was 650, where every meet I'd pull over 700, like always, you know, in the meet. But 650 was, I mean, I hated that bar. I mean, it just did not bend. And, uh, but that's what we used, and it got us all big deadlifts. Got Matt Dimbo 821 after blowing both patellas off and quad tendons. 
he came back and pulled 821 PR deadlift by using that bar. Another question we have is on grip. If you have a, a an under and over grip, should you ever mix that up, or what you start with should you finish with? I watch the guy. It's back to what I mentioned before. I watch him train, you know, at meets, and he in I watch him in a warm He always switch grips every set, switch him this way to this way. I never could do it. And I watch a lot of guys. If you tear a bicep, which mm -hmm. I have no bicep but one arm, and a pretty good tear on the other. But I watched uh, like uh, my Brett, Brett Tracy, Steve Wilson. They called him Curl. His arms are so big. They switched grips and they tore the other bicep. So I don't. I, I here's how I, my theory was. I tore his bicep off. My at the senior nationals. My glamour said I'm done. Mm -hmm. I was already pulling 700 a power rack when the magazine came out. And six months later, made the third highest total I ever made, pulling 30 more pounds, pulled 705. I tore up 672. I thought I tore my bicep off. What else can I do to it? So I never switch grips. And I've, I never switch grips in this day. You'll notice if a person stands up and you, and you hold your hand straight down your side and you turn it over, it goes way out. You're putting a lot of stress on your shoulder and, and uh, hand. Hook grip, I suggest as many people could hook, should hook. But see, like I said, if you turn your, look at the center of my hand right now. If I turn that hand over, now the center's moved out that far. So you're going to windmill the bar and it's going to be rough on your spine and it's very hard on your shoulder. And that's how they end up tearing the other bicep off. I warned them, don't switch, don't switch grips. Can barbell rows be used as a deadlift exercise? That's huge. Yeah. Uh, I remember Eddie Cohn told me and I was, you know, he's the strongest guy I've ever seen. I think you should row at least half what your deadlift is. You know, legit. Jeez. Not cheating. Yeah. Yeah, legit. And I, I believe it. I think that's, you know, you talk about a web, uh, like, you, you know, you should, you know, you should incline this much, decline this much, see the press that much, and you'll bench this much. Same thing for deadlifts and so forth. That's one of the webs. Like in the squat, you need to do your reverse hypers with a minimum of 50% of your squat. All right? A minimum. And strict. And lots. Like maybe we are up, we were doing 100 reps in one workout before. So people still do that. Are there any Olympic lifts that would help uh, as a deadlift exercise? I think power cleans are great just for building your upper back. That's what it's for. It's, um, I did uh, years ago, I was an Olympic lifter. Then I went to power. And, uh, but I had a uh, Hercules 555 set. It's a one-inch bar. Of course, it didn't revolve. I power cleaned 320 off that bar, uh, you know, without touching my body when I pulled 670. Yeah. I did a lot of power cleans then. Um, a George, George uh, friend, of course, he's a thrower, a hammer thrower. He did a lot of power cleans. Power clean, power, I see nothing wrong with it as a lift. Mm -hmm. I got another, nothing to say bad about the lift. It's just Olympic lifting is not going to make you an athlete. It's just mm -hmm. a... These coaches are out of their mind. They need to open up a book, find out what. There's no such a thing as an explosive lift. It's the training weight that you use, 30 to 40 percent. You want explosive curls? Use 30 to 40 percent. It has nothing to do. It have nothing to do with being explosive. Where they get to stuff is just be on me. The snatch grip deadlift seems to be a that top shelf tool you pull out when you want to get rapid results. Why Why is that lift so hard and why does it have such high carryover? Because most because people don't do power cleans or something. So their upper back is, is you know, nowhere near what their lower back is. Yeah. I mean, my, never, my lower back, basically after breaking it, you learn to train it. My lower back, to this day, it, it's, I have a crazy lower back if I want to train it. You know, it's just, and, you know, you do stuff for years and years and years, it, gets, it, it never leaves you. You know, you ever watch an old man that boxed all the time? He could box a 70. You know, it's not like he forgets how to box. He can no. still box because he boxed all of his damn life, you know. Then one of the last ones we have is, and we've I've seen it here, is some of the strongman implements, the weighted wheelbarrow and the yoke. Yeah. How important are they for deadlifting? Because it seems that strongmen have hellacious deadlifters within the sport. My buddy Sakari said that uh, he had he had three or four guys could pull 900 over in Finland. They used straps, but still, uh, they they pushed a thousand pound wheelbarrow 30, 30 feet, I think it was, mm -hmm. sprinted with it and heavy yokes. And so that's how important it is. I I didn't nail up. I have a lot of rib problems, and two times this happened to me. But one in the deadlift, I was, I pulled sled for six weeks. I did glute ham. I did reverse hyper and always trained my abs. 
Um, but they come out and got me. We're having a contest at Chuck Vogelpole. Jerks me out. Of the, I'm out on the sled. I mean, for 45 minutes. Because I would go to my feet would go numb. Mm-hmm. So they drive me in there. We're having a contest. These South Africans. I pulled 775. That's, uh, my record in, ever in the gym was 745. I pulled easy 775. I hadn't done a deadlift in six weeks. And um, I used to train Circa Max, uh, 485 and, a, and 375 pound of band. And we would do we would do five doubles. Mm-hmm. So one day I had the guys from the Steelers here and Pitt University. And I'm out, again, I'm outside. And here comes Mike Ruggiero and Chuck. Come on, you got to squat with us. I go, oh, fuck, you know. I haven't squatted in six weeks because of my ribs. And I said, okay, I walk in, so what are you going to use? And Reverend Tony from down south, he had a 920 squat just like I did. So they said, he said uh, 485, a blue and a green band. Mike was a 1,000-pound squatter. So I'm going, holy crap. I mean, I'm in front of all these guys. I did that workout like I never missed. Tony would take a, had to take a band off for Tony. <laughs> but I did it like I never missed. I, I know what the influence of sled dragging is. I, I mean, for me, it was, it was a yeah. pulling sleds. But there's a big difference... I notice when you pull sleds, yeah. everything, every step is with intention, yeah. and it's a maximum effort. Every and the sled jerks nearly right. verbatim the same. Th- then there's other people who just cruise, right? Are they go on their toes? They don't use their heels. So it's very important important to have intention of what you're doing. Too many people lean way too far forward. Mm-hmm. If you do carry med ball, and I'll keep you straight up and down, and you're right, reach out as far as you can off heel. Now it's sled dragging. It's not sprinting. So reach out off your heel when it touches. You got to pull. And like you said, mm-hmm. Tommy. Every, when you touch clang, 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 the solo jerk every time. That way it's the maximum. Every, every step is the first step, even after uh, 60 yards. And from a coaching perspective, you don't even have to look. You can hear, and you know, there's right. a big bilateral deficit, like, which we, we, we had a kid on tape that we figured out real quick. He had a, yep. an issue with that. Like hitting a bag. Yep. A good guy, box player knows you're hitting a bag right. It's all about rhythm. You hear mm-hmm. the way it goes. Um, Lou, that's all we have from the, uh, the questions in today. Have you any concluding comments for people who are starting out and want to build up their deadlift? I, w- I want to say one thing. It's about the weights. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's indirect, but it's very direct. You know, uh, in week one, we'll do 80% for uh, 25 sets, five in the squat, and the same in the dead. Mm-hmm. In week two, it's 85%. Five by fives on both. That's 50 lifts. Week three, it's 90%. So we're doing 50 lifts at 90%. On uh, every third week, all right. Plus during the week, you know, we got two, you know, it, you know, we got max effort days for this squat and dead. So during the week, we're going to do uh, six lifts. So you're, you're going to do um, about ninety close to record in a record. So you got three more there, but in two lifts. So that's at six more. So at times we're doing fifty-six, ninety percent plus lifts uh, in one week. Mm-hmm. Then we drop it back. 10, see, it goes up five, up five, drop back 10. To 10 is restoration. And um, I, I, I've got, you know, there's two models in my gym. Mm-hmm. I got a group over there to pretty much take care of themselves, and I, I run the other group. My group could take 85% and do 15 reps easy. The other group is lucky to get to five. And there's no GPP. They won't think, why is GPP important? So you recover to do the damn workout. How's that? And those are the guys, all my guys are the ones that get to deadlifts at the end of the week. They work, those guys wear out and they can't pull a deadlift. And that's a big thing that you don't see until you're in here, but you have very, very strong and established lifters come in and they get halfway through speed oh, work and they're done. They can't do it, yeah. The same when we had Olympic athletes come in with the MMA crew and these are Olympic athletes and they were done halfway through to where uh, density and GPP is huge and you still get, them, you get way more done in a short space of time. And that's what a lot of these people don't get. And, it, and it's hard to, to say it uh, through film or through microphone, but when you see it, they walk in looking like Mr. Universe and they're huffing and puffing halfway through. And these are people who are at the top of their game. I remember one of the top um, swim sprinters in the country came here and we had a girl in there and I said, don't let that girl kick your ass. And that guy was on the floor, you know, and she was still rolling like nothing. I said, I told you, don't let her kick her head. He was on, this guy was like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, looked like a million bucks. Yeah. And I so said, we've had linebackers who get their ass oh. kicked by 16-year-old girls doing sleds. Oh, yeah. And that's not disparaging the girls, just that people have got no idea what strength is, what training capacity is. They always underestimate everything. Yeah. I underestimate, I started working with uh, Kevin Randall years ago, and I underestimate, I mean, I'm thinking, oh, I, you know, I can handle these guys. Then they got in the gym. 
And I found out real clear, holy crap, because I hear people, oh, I'm not afraid of them. I said, buddy, you better be afraid of them or you'll be dead. You know? <laughs> well, you... I wasn't the toughest guy in the world, but I found out what an ass kicking is real fast. Especially, you see it on TV, three minutes boxing, five minutes UFC, oh. and then you're 30 seconds in and you're like, Oh, they, they can do whatever they want. All I can do is swing for the fences. Yep. Now, there's a big, even when the worst thing you can be is averagely good against a phenomenal per, like fighter. Yeah. And you see it to where it's just. You, you, you see it even on TV. Yeah. You see a, a good fighter fight a champion, and it, it really shows that he's just a good fighter. I watched Ray Mancini uh, fight years ago, and he fought a guy, um, four time world champion, Alexis Arguello. And he beat Ray. He beat Ray to death. His 15 round fight. Yeah. And they and they, and so they interviewed him at the end. And he fought him right up here in Youngstown. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And he, he said, "What's the difference between you and Ray?" And he, he looks up in the air. He goes, "Well, he said I'm a 15 round fighter and Ray's a 10 round fighter. And that's what it was. He's just a club fighter." It's a it's amazing how. Um... I mean, he compared to Alexis Arroyo. Then I watched Aaron Pryor, who was a little wild man beat him and they fought again and I was in Colorado and watched his fight and he knocked him down and he knocked him down again and they, they, they called the fight off. And they, they asked our well, says, could you got up? You've never seen this on TV. I see this live. And he goes, I could have got up, but I feared for my life. That's a four time world champion fighting a little buzzsaw though. Who do you, who do you think was ahead of their time with training and boxing? Oh, fudge. The guys that train Roberto Duran, uh, of course, the guys way years ago trained uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah, yeah, guys like that. It's a uh, it's amazing when you look at Crank Jim. The similarities to where how that was run to how you ran well, or run Westside Barbell. You, you see great defensive fighters back then. You don't see so many nowadays. You know, okay. and um, Ezra Charles and guys like that. And they they, they fought like this. You yeah. remember George Foreman fought yeah. like, like that. You don't see no one fight like that no more. You know, they worry use a cross defense. And you don't see it anymore, but they were excellent boxers. Nowadays, I mean, you got guys holding their arms down. You see, you see it all. But like that, like look at Lomachenko. Look at his yeah. footwork. But you see the progression. But they start taking training more serious, and well, I wouldn't say serious, but more structured. And uh, what well, he did, dance. Yeah. I've all thing. If you like, which yeah. is bizarre, but you think it makes a lot of sense. His footwork is phenomenal. I heard a story about uh, Willie Pep years ago. Said he went around not throw a punch. Same thing with uh, him. Yeah. He went around by not, you know, he went around and if he didn't throw a punch. So it's the same thing, just dance circles around somebody. That's what boxing is. That's, I like slugging people personally, but you know. Yeah. You know but you got to admire it. Looks like, a, I'm never a big fan of Floyd Mayweather, but man, he was an unbelievable defensive fighter. Jesus. And he always finds a way. Yeah. Like, and he, you got to see he's driven. He goes out, runs yeah. back from nightclubs at two or three in the morning. Like he has he that work at, yeah. yeah. It's, um, like boxing is an amazing sport, especially when you look at the training. I remember um, when I lost a lot of money on Mr. David Hay back oh. back in the back, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I I lost, said, you, you lost money on a rerun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got on a rerun. Oh, jeez, <laughs> tough crowd. I, I always said yeah. that uh, Dave Hoff was like Floyd Mayweather, you yeah. know, Junior, because it, how Floyd came up in the gym with his dad and his uncle and everybody, you know, he's a little kid. Dave came up the same way. World record holders surround them, everybody. This system, Bob Cove took him through like your dad would take you through the zoo. Yeah. I mean, and it, and, but he's special, just yeah. like Floyd. Well, and that's... You got to have that brain. That's where I made the mistake. And hey, I was looking at all the training he was doing and completely forgot about the boxing aspect, <laughs> which is a very important part when you're a boxer. Yeah. Um, and then he got, because they went too far down the training road, I think. Mm -hmm. And they forgot, really, it doesn't matter how in shape you are, you got a good... Too uh, much GPP yeah. and not SP. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know the difference. And um, they either lean on strength conditioning too much and they forget about boxing or they go too much of boxing. And it's, it's like everything. It's a delicate balance between everything. It's like in sport here, you know, we, like I said, 80% of our training is just special exercise. Once we teach a guy how to live correctly, and if you make a muscle stronger, you should squat bench and they live more. Same thing with the clean dirt and snatch. You know, the conjugate club was invented in 1972. Bert and Medvedev oversaw it for track and field weightlifting. They started with like a 20 to 40 exercises, 24 to 40 exercises. And at the end, it, 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 with, uh, with the weightlifters especially, mm -hmm. 
And they, they said, well, what do you think? And one said, I liked it. And the rest said they wanted more exercise. They wanted more exercise. And that's, to me, what I say about the money, I put a million dollars in the parking lot under a rock. You got, if you go out and pick up a rock, it ain't there, you ain't going home. You'll pick up every rock. And I'm telling you people, if you hang around here and you learn what, what exercise to make you strong, the sky is the limit. I mean, everyone can't be a world champion, but everyone can be as good as they can be. And sometimes that's, that's, that's tough enough for a person. Um, you got to work. The, the important word you said there is learn. Yeah. Because a lot of people will turn over all the rocks, but then they forget what rocks they turned over. <laughs> that's true. And they go back, and it's keeping that record because they look at you, but you keep everything in your head, yeah. which is very rare that people can remember. Like, you won't remember names, but if they lifted in your gym, you'll remember their lift. And that's a big thing is to keep records of everything. I just get these new guys. got a lot of new guys. And right now, I'm just getting them to get big in the JM press. And it's shown right away in the bench press. Yeah. But, you know, they've been here for six, eight months. So I finally just now got to the to the JM press with the camera bench bar. And, I mean, it's it's making a difference. You well, know, Boom and Garrett yeah. and these guys, they're going, holy crap, man. And that arch bar, because these new bench shirts, you got to put the bar way up high. Yeah. You know, we've always been down in here. So that arch bar not only teaches you your scapula, but teach you to stretch the bar for your triceps. It took us two years to get that through George Howard's head. Yeah. Once we did, he started slamming world records one after another. We don't even know what got through his head, but it did. Like, I don't give a damn who tells him, as long as he gets told. You know, I'll tell people something, and if someone else said, he's running, I'm going, like, I've been telling you that for a year. <laughs> but it, it just didn't register. We don't even know who got it through George's head, but it did. How much do you think bench press helps boxing? I think, you know, you can over bench press. You don't need to do a lot. I would do a lot of overhead pressing, mm -hmm. especially dumbbells and stuff like that. A guy, uh, you know, I think it was Knight, said that uh, if you can overhead press 300, you can bench three. But if you can bench three, chances are you'll never overhead press mm -hmm. three. He's right. You know, overhead press is a tough one. We, I, I, you know, it's a different subject here, I guess, but we're still talking. Yeah, about yeah. Um, I mean, I watched, I watched this and say, Kenny's 640 roll. George, 625 raw, 230. Uh, you know, Nick Winter, 700 double. All right, this is a few. I mean, I had 15 guys that could do this kind of stuff. And one thing in common, seated press, incline press, you know, about one-third of the workout was seated, one-third incline, and uh, one-third bench, and mostly close grip. They would, they would sometimes do the ultra-wise like I would, but for the most part, they stayed inside the ring, and it's all arms. And I said, Kenny lifted in the Arnold, and he, uh, they come up from Carson Newman University, um, and uh, the coach there, Dan, said, hey, can you, can you say something to the fireman team? I said something stupid, like always. I said, Kenny, can you do something? Now, Kenny lifted the day before, Saturday. Kenny goes, okay, I hope him load up 455 pounds. I go, well, what, what's he going to do? Loads up 455, and the smooth part of bar comes in two inches and bends it for 10 reps cold. I mean, people go say, that guy's a liar. I'll tell you, there's people in my gym. I tell stories all the time, and they look at me, I'm nuts. And then Fred Tracy and Don Dammer come in and tell the same thing. I said, well, there you go. Time. Time. When I first, like, Lou, uh, yeah. this guy is full of shit. There's, there's no <laughs> way this. Ha and then the longer you're here, you're like, I cannot believe that's true. And then nothing surprises you anymore because the most outrageous, unthinkable things happen all the time, especially when you're dealing with athletes who are very unique and slightly so, crazy. Someone read an article about Dave, Dave Tate and how I, uh, I was the most mental strong person I'd ever seen. He thought I was full of crap and then screw around forever. Finally did, they got real strong and all this. But the reason I was, because he said like when Kenny called me out of retirement, he said not only from my retirement, then I started kicking their ass and they were 60 pounds bigger than me. And the reason I, had, I was mentally tough was because of them. Mm -hmm. I use my training partners. Every if it's in a gym, you must learn to utilize it. If you don't, you know, I, why does a samurai carry more than one sword? Yep. He don't carry it for show, you know. And I use those guys. Um, that's what made me do what I did. Especially when I came back at 50 years old and older. I mean, you know, I I, I said, I, you know, I can't stand these. When I was a kid, I didn't want to be by, be by old men. Yeah. When I get older, I didn't want to be by young men. I ran with hatred in the gym all the time. Like when you was pulling my briefs up, you must be wrapping my hands, and I'm, I'm dead serious, man. You know, that's how that gym was. It had to be that way back then. And that gym was no joke. 
So, uh, like, like Dave said, the place is small. Everybody's on the edge. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, it was fun but dangerous. I thought, I thought probably 15 times Chuck Liverpool's going to punch me in the face. Because <laughs> I, I said what I wanted to say, you know. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm ready. I'm ready to start ducking because I think he's going to fucking punch me. But, you know, it never happened. But that's how that gym ran. You know, they turned all that aggression into the barbell. And that's what you should do. You know, we're not fighters. We're, we're weight power lifters. But it worked. But those guys, I always give them all the credit in the world for what I did. Well, and you said, a, I think a few years back, but the people you had in here, you had to be the way you are. Because if you didn't give them any structure or be as hard as necessary, not as possible, um, they they wouldn't have achieved what they did because they had no structure anywhere else. Right. And you talk to them outside of here, everyone from the past generation talked to, this is the best time of their life yeah. because it gave them a structure. You had people, this is back in the 80s, who would go on vacation, fly back for squat day, <laughs> not miss it, and then fly back on vacation because if you missed a day, that was it, you were done. Yeah. But they needed that. And that's a, a big thing that people don't realize, the dynamics of your training partners and gym is everything. Right. That's what you, you got to rely on, man. And, yep. Well, Luke, that's, that's everything we have for today. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up now and we'll be back to you uh, next month.